Hi, Mike Aben here with a KSP tutorial. We have Val and Bill here in the Rescue One, and they're trying to get to Jeb. But this is a bit of a different situation than what we looked at before. See, here is the Rescue One, and here is Jeb. They are in the same orbit, but Jeb is about 100 kilometers behind them. So we're going to talk about how to deal with this particular situation. What we're going to end up talking about is something called orbit phasing. A really useful skill to have. So here we are. We have, there's the waypoint. There's where Jeb is that way. And a really tempting thing to do is to simply take your vehicle and point it straight at your target and start to burn. As commonsensical as this may seem, it turns out that it won't work very well. See, the problem is that we have this big old planet beneath us. When we start burning backwards in our orbit, we will be slowing down which will cause our orbit to lose altitude. And as we fall towards the planet's surface, we'll begin to pick up speed, and that will actually cause us to move away from Jeb. Paradoxically, the right thing to do is to actually burn away from Jeb in a prograde direction. This will raise the altitude of our orbit, which will slow us down, and thus increasing our orbital period. With us moving more slowly, we can then let Jeb catch up to us. You see, them being in the same orbit but in different positions, the parlance for that is to say that the two vehicles are out of phase with each other. So what we need to do is get them in phase. And so what we're going to talk about in this episode is about orbital phasing, a really useful skill to have in a number of situations. Now here what I've done is I've just set up a maneuver node, and I'm just pointing out that as I give myself more prograde, notice how those closest approach indicators are coming together. There they are right there. But the truth is we actually don't even need the maneuver node. All you need to do is point yourself in a prograde direction. Oops, my engines aren't on here. Let's engage those. There we are. As I was saying, point yourself in a prograde direction and start to burn and just keep an eye on those closest approach indicators. And it's going to be the purple ones, I believe, here that are going to come together first. So I'll just select them and watch that closest approach distance as they come closer and closer. Oh, they're getting in there now. Oh, point one kilometers. No, no, that's it. That's as good as I'm going to get. Excellent. Let's leave it that way. And I'm just going to put the ship on the normal vectors, this, or the normal vector. This will make sure that the solar panels are nicely exposed. But then I'm going to go out to map view so that we can actually watch what's going on. And we'll center here on Kerbin and then just start time warping. And what the thing to notice is that as we gain altitude, our ship will be slowing down and Jeb will be catching up to us. And by the way, if Jeb were ahead of us in the orbit, then I would need to speed myself up and I would do the opposite. I would burn retrograde again in the opposite direction as to where Jeb is. This would decrease my, uh, my altitude, increase my orbital period, and speed me up so that we can then catch up to Jeb. The issue is that sometimes you may not be able to lower your orbit enough before entering the atmosphere or smacking into the surface. Depending on the situation, burning prograde to increase your orbit might be the only option. But even when behind, slowing yourself down will eventually bring you to your target. It just might take a while. And by the way, in the second part of this video, we're going to uh, take a little bit of a look at the delta V requirements for doing these kind of phasing orbits, and in particular looking at how to calculate the delta V requirements for going from an elliptical orbit to another elliptical orbit. That's a very, very useful uh, thing to know. The actual rendezvous works the same as it always does. Make sure your nav ball is in target mode and kill off your relative velocity while hurting the retrograde icon towards the target icon. Once again, the big advice is to take your time. Come in slowly and then use time warp to speed things up rather than coming in fast. So with that rendezvous successfully performed, let's kick this up a notch. 
Here we have the Rescue 2 over 2,000 kilometers above the surface. And I've beefed up the vessel because we're going to need the extra fuel. We are in a bit of an elliptical orbit here, as you can see. We have an apoapsis of 2,750 kilometers and a periapsis of just 87 kilometers. Jeb is in the same orbit he was just before, a circular 100 kilometer orbit. Let's take what we've learned to go get him. We're going to set up a similar phasing orbit as what we did last time. And to do that, we need to first raise our periapsis up to the same altitude as Jeb's orbit. So you can see our periapsis there is a little bit below Jeb's orbit. And uh, so what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to burn prograde in order to... Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Let's get ourselves to the right position first. Of course, the right position to be in to raise our periapsis would be at the opposite side of our orbit at apoapsis. So we'll just time warp up to that. This is not going to be too much of a burn. Okay. There we are. We'll put ourselves now onto the prograde vector. Zoom in on periapsis and select that once again so that I can watch the altitude of my periapsis. And then we'll just time warp a bit more, get ourselves to about 10 seconds from apoapsis. There we go. And this should just be a little bit burning. Alright, a little more. There we go, that, that ought to do it. And we're going to aim for our rendezvous to be down here at periapsis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a maneuver node down here. But the issue is, here, let's select Jeb as a target. And you can see here that uh, when we get down here to periapsis, Jeb is going to be over here. So we are quite a ways ahead of him. So what we need to do is set ourselves up a phasing orbit so that we will match up with him. And I'm going to start off by just giving myself some retrograde. And the thing to notice here is that the closest approach indicators here aren't moving. And in order to fix that, what we need to do is just move our maneuver a little, oh god, there's so much stuff right in this spot. I need to move this node a little bit forward. And there we go, it just jumped, jumped to a new location, so that means it's now active. That happens sometimes, so let's give ourselves a little more retrograde. I'm just using the scroll wheel on the mouse. And notice how that close and pros indicator is now starting to come around, and come around to periapsis. So there we go, it just, I just blew by it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep going because sometimes uh, you can get it to come around a second time, but no, it's not happening here. I can already see my orbit is now below Jeb's orbit, so I need to take off some of that retrograde. And again, what I'm doing is I'm just looking at that closest approach indicator. Here it comes. Let's select it so I can keep an eye on the numbers. Oh, i got to select this one. Uh, yeah, I can see it there and all that. Let's get the node up one more time. More retrograde. We are getting close. Okay, oh, under, oh, oh, 0.1 kilometers. Excellent. Alright, now with that set up, let's zoom out of here. Oh, and again, there we go, so we can get a good look at what's going on. So what's going to happen here is Rescue 2 is going to fall down towards periapsis. We're going to perform the burn here, which is going to put us into this phasing orbit, which we're going to go around once, and by the time we get back here to periapsis again, we should be rendezvousing with Jeb. So let's time warp to periapsis. Oops, okay. There we go, let's start time warping. You can see Jeb going round and round as we come down here, going much faster than we are, of course. And we'll stop 
we got about a minute to go to the node. There we go. Now notice that uh, we're being told that the time of this burn will be 54 seconds. So I'm going to start the burn at half that at 27 seconds. So we'll just orient the craft so that it is on the node. Which one is this one up here that does it? There we go. And we will just wait till we're at about 27, maybe a smidge before 27 seconds. Okay, 29, 28, let's do it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Now it's telling us that the amount of burn is going to be 19 seconds. Okay, so we'll restart this at 10 seconds. Thanks for the update game. All right, nine, let's go. Righty. A bit of a bigger burn than what we had last time. We are reducing our orbit quite a bit. As we close in, we'll slow down for the last bit of this burn. delete the node here and finish this off just by locking us onto the prograde vector, selecting the closest approach indicators, just giving us some puffs here to finish off. Ooh, there we go, 0.1 kilometers again, nice, all right, so all that is left to do can see that we are quite a bit ahead of Jebediah as predicted. Again, we'll just watch this from map view so you can get a good idea of what's going on. So there we are. We are going into our higher orbit, which of course means that we're going slower than Jebediah. And in the meantime, Jebediah will be catching up to us. And of course, once we are back at Periapsis, our two vehicles should be back together. Now, one thing to actually notice is that at our closest approach, our encounter speed is about 205 meters per second. That is quite a bit higher than what you have seen in our previous rendezvous is because our orbits are so different. But really, that doesn't change how you approach this. You just need to be a little bit more careful, start reducing your speed a little bit earlier. But otherwise, this works exactly the same as you've seen with all the rest of our rendezvous. Hopefully you now understand how orbit phasing works. With it you can handle a wide variety of rendezvous situations and also situations where you need to put objects in specific orbits and especially in specific locations in specific orbits. Like for instance now with 1.2 we have to think about things like communication networks. So when you need to get that communication satellite in not only a particular orbit but in a particular location this orbit phasing idea is your friend coming up and let's do the math i'll revisit the delta v equations for home and transfers and look at how to calculate what the delta v requirements would be for the rendezvous that you just saw Back in episode 3, I talked about Hohmann transfers. That's the standard technique that is used to move from one circular orbit to another circular orbit in the same plane. The idea is to connect the two orbits with an elliptical transfer orbit. If we were traveling from orbit 1 to orbit 2, we would accomplish this by first performing a burn at position 1, and then riding the transfer orbit halfway around to position 2, where we would perform a second burn to insert ourselves into the second orbit. In that episode, I then used the Law of Conservation of Energy and Kepler's Second Law to derive the two formulas for calculating what the delta V requirements would be for these two burns. This is the formula for the delta V for burn 1, and here's the formula for burn 2. It's important to understand that this process is entirely symmetrical in the reverse order. You could just as easily be starting in orbit 2 and move to orbit 1, but the formulas would remain exactly the same. The second formula would be used to calculate the delta V for burn 2, which would be the first burn that you would perform. And the first formula would be used for burn 1, now the second burn to perform. So when you see the delta V1, don't think of it as the formula for calculating the delta V of the first burn you would perform. 
Rather, it is the formula for calculating the burn at position 1, which is the burn at the lower altitude. Similarly, delta V2 is not necessarily the second burn chronologically, but rather the amount of the burn at position 2, which is the burn at the higher altitude. Before I get into using these formulas again, I want to clean them up a little bit by introducing a new bit of terminology. If I take the average of the two radii of the orbits, that is, add them and divide by two, I get this value A, which we call the semi-major axis of the elliptical transfer orbit. Notice that in both the formulas, in the fraction inside one of the square roots, we have a 2 in the numerator and an r1 plus r2 in the denominator, which is the reciprocal of the semi-major axis A. That means we can replace that part of the formulas with just a single A in the denominator of each fraction. This doesn't really change anything when performing calculations, but it does simplify the formulas a bit and make them easier to remember. Also, the semi-major axis is a useful number in other places, so it is worth knowing it. The only reason I didn't introduce it back in episode 3 is because there was enough stuff being thrown at you in that tutorial already. With that done, let's look at what we did in the second rendezvous of this video. We started in an elliptical orbit with a periapsis of 687 kilometers and an apoapsis of 3,352 kilometers. Note that I am measuring all distances from the center of Kerbin. Recall that Kerbin has a radius of 600 kilometers. We ultimately moved ourselves into a circular orbit with a radius of 700 kilometers to rendezvous with Jeb. We accomplished this by first performing a burn at apoapsis to create this transfer orbit. We then rode this elliptical orbit halfway around and performed two burns at periapsis. The first was to create a phasing orbit, which I'm not showing here, to time our final rendezvous with Jeb. And then a final burn once we had returned to periapsis to match velocities with Jeb. What I'm interested in is calculating the total cost of all three of these burns. Let's start with burn one. Note that this is not a Hohmann transfer. A Hohmann transfer starts and ends with circular orbits, but here we are starting from an elliptical orbit. In fact, burn 1 changes one elliptical orbit into another elliptical orbit. How are we to apply our delta v formulas to this situation? Don't worry, it can be done and it isn't even that difficult. We start by imagining we are in a circular orbit with a radius equal to our apoapsis. We then calculate the burn required to lower our periapsis down to our target orbit. This is a straightforward Hohmann transfer, and as this is the burn at the higher altitude, we use the delta V2 formula. Here are the numbers for the formula. Recall that mu is the standard gravitational parameter. We can look up this number for Kerbin on the KSP wiki, or you can recall that it is simply the universal gravitational constant, uppercase g, multiplied against the mass of Kerbin, which you can get in-game in the tracking station. R1 and R2 are self-explanatory, and A is the semi-major axis. Plugging into the formula we get this, and pushing through a calculator produces a delta V of 423 meters per second. Of course, we didn't start with a circular orbit, we started with this orbit. Let's now calculate the delta V requirement for lowering our periapsis from our hypothetical circular orbit to the periapsis of our actual orbit. We use the exact same formula. In fact, the only thing that changes is the value of R1, which is now 687,000 meters. Plugging in and pushing this through a calculator gets 428 meters per second. Now look at the diagram carefully and consider what must be the delta V requirement for burn 1, which raised our, the periapsis of our orbit from 787 kilometers to 700 kilometers. I'm hoping that you realize that it is going to be the difference in the two delta Vs that we just calculated. That is, the delta V for burn 1 is 428 minus 423, or just 5 meters per second. Now I know that this seems almost insignificantly small, and in this situation it probably is, but being able to calculate the delta V cost from one elliptical orbit to another is a useful skill, and it won't always be as cheap as what you see here. Now let's look back and see what actually happened. 
I never did set up a maneuver for this burn, but we can still see what the delta V spent was by simply comparing the velocity of rescue 2 before and after the burn was completed. Just before the burn, my velocity was 598 meters per second. And then we start the burn. Again, I'm just waiting for my periapsis to get up to 100. There we go, 603 meters per second. I added 5 meters per second to my velocity exactly as would have been predicted. Now how about the next two burns, which eventually reduced my transfer orbit to a circular orbit of a radius of 700 kilometers. As these two burns were performed in the same location, we can calculate the sum of the two burns as if this was done in a single burn. Indeed, if it wasn't for having to rendezvous with Jeb, there would have been no reason for a phasing orbit and this would have been done in just a single burn. Thankfully, this combined burn is just a standard Hohmann transfer burn. As this burn is at the lower altitude, we use the delta V1 formula. Here are the numbers, plugging in, and after a bit of calculation we get 643 meters per second. Let's compare this to what actually happened. Now I did use a maneuver node for the first part of this burn and we can see here that the amount of that burn was 439 meters per second. The second part of the burn was actually done in a series of short burns as Rescue 2 matched velocities with Jebediah. Adding up all of these individual burns would sure be tedious but thankfully we don't have to. All we have to do is look at what our closest approach relative velocity was before we started reducing speed. And you can see here it was 205 meters per second. 205 plus 439 gets us a combined 644 meters per second, only one off from what was predicted by theory. I hope you are seeing how useful the two Hohmann transfer formulas are. With them you can calculate delta V requirements for transferring between any two orbits that are in the same plane. While working within a single sphere of influence, all that's really left to talk about are inclination changes, but that is going to have to be a topic for a separate tutorial. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you for the next one.